Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope that this video finds you well and in good health. Namo myoho renge kyo. Today, today, we're reading a Gosho that, um, you know, of all the letters that Nichiren, that are still extant of of Nichiren. We've we read many that are to uh his students. And uh a few that are to his uh inner circle, I will say, uh his major followers who are not just students but also teachers. Actually Nichiren talks to everybody as though they are um fellow teachers and uh, uh, promulgators of the Lotus Sutra. This is the practice of Buddhism. After, after all, our goal in Buddhism is not only to reach enlightenment, but to reach full enlightenment by which uh, or for which we must develop our bodhisattva uh, way, our bodhisattva nature. And that's actually kind of innate to us humans. We're very social creatures, right? So the point is to integrate your practice so that your thinking is constantly on Buddha, Buddha-ness, your inner Buddha. Instead of your thinking being pulled and distracted by all the desires and foibles and sufferings of life, um, to constantly have your mind come from a place of understanding in Buddha without attachment. Now that's not an easy task. It sounds really uh, simple at first. Um, really the only time, especially when we're beginning Buddhism, the only time we're really experiencing that kind of detached uh, uh, existing is when we're in front of our mandala focused on Gohonzon and chanting the Daimoku. Um, it actually, I think, can take some time to understand that what happens in front of our mandala is uh, an altered life state. Um, it's so simple to do, you see, um uh, without all of these uh long extended rituals and uh, isolation and all these other old uh ideas to to learn these things we in the late in the latter day of the law the these modern times uh we have such tremendous capacity to understand and to experience um and the other side of that is we have such tremendous uh, distraction. Uh, it, it, we're constantly being pulled in a thousand directions. Uh, and we navigate that with seemingly with ease uh, in our modern day. But uh, the result of that navigation and that, that kind of categorization that we're constantly doing in our minds is a kind of a... For some of us, it's a numbness. For others, it's kind of a um, an empty feeling. Um, I remember one member saying, "I always felt like I had a hole inside me," uh, and, and it's it's tough to to talk about that stuff because uh, uh, you either come from an emotional perspective or you come from an intellectual perspective perspective of, of great frustration um, and, and it's almost like when you sit and chant uh, and focus on the mandala to awaken your gohonzon and your buddha wisdom um, it's kind of a refueling a filling up it, it can feel that way uh, and the more you do it the more you understand that it's your mind it's your mind that's being nurtured and growing and expanding and and releasing so much stress because the suffering is disappearing the suffering is disappearing because the desires and the distractions 
are going away and your mind is simply experiencing clearly without obstacles this a magnificent thing called the life process right which is the the wonder of buddhaness it's the ability to experience that and live in that condition and the goal is to retrain the mind so much so consistently that as we walk away from our altar from our position of great focus and awakening of our buddha mind that we hang on to it as much as possible so that we can navigate our daily lives with that same mind after many years of practice or after many hours of daimoku and re reciting uh you know you can do a, a campaign if you will to really experience this and and, and sit for hours uh reciting and chanting and, and especially with friends that it's like that's a huge multiplier right and then you go out into the world or just doing what needs be done as human beings and everything seems different everything looks differently everything uh, you know and slowly we get little chunks get taken away and we start slipping back into samsara and but the more we do it the more we train ourselves the less we're dragged down and to help in that as we're cleansing our minds certain ingrained tendencies that is our our choo-choo train of karma right <laughs> uh, slowly uh, alter or ebb away and the obstacles we seem to have always had in our lives oh this always happens to me oh it's like you know blah 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 life is circular blah 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 that stops being so true because suddenly we don't encounter this, the same patterns as we used to because our karma is changing we're influencing our our momentum our kinetic energy we're influencing it toward enlightenment toward buddhaness this is the life of buddhist practice right now because it takes a while to really and and you know you hear always about the new the new buddhist benefits whatever you might call them uh yeah you know uh in anything new when you have that zeal when you really want to punch through and you go wow this i want to see this work and boy you see evidence of it you know in some way every little thing that happens is <gasps> amazing right um but the newness wears off because we're human and we get accustomed to things really fast. And even though we're revolutionizing our mind and changing our lives, we're going, yeah, 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 it's because I chant, you know. Oh, I'm having a problem. I need to go chant, you know. We might even get annoyed about it because it's, it's so easy. <laughs> we're so spoiled. It's amazing. Um, and you know you can read all the the go shows and the sutras telling you you know don't don't relax don't back don't backslide don't quit don't go titan right um but if you're going to you're going to it's just our human nature and then it becomes just a matter of time before you notice man my life's shit again <laughs> <laughs> you know, how do you, then you got to drag yourself up by your your belt loop and go i got to get back to chanting what the heck am i doing right we all go through it um and so uh don't feel lesser because you've been through it and don't feel guilt there's no use being guilty about it just get back to your practice anyway all of that is to say that to to teach this process to to offer this uh path to other human beings 
on the one hand, is incredibly simple. Just chant Namu Myoho kyo right? But on, on the long term, and not even that long, just, just do this for three months, for six months, try it out. You know, we adopt behaviors over many months and years without giving it a second thought. But when it's something that's revolutionary, that actually changes our lives and requires just some effort, just sit, get, get a mandala of Gohanzan, set it up in a nice altar without distraction and recite this couple of chapters here, chant to it every day. Because it, the chant of it, is your Buddha. It's not it. We don't worship this thing, right? What we do is enliven this innate experience and mind and ability within ourselves. It's like Pilates for our life condition, <laughs> right? But boy, it requires some effort. And we are basically lazy creatures. We get tired of the same thing too quickly. So to nurture somebody and to assist them in this path, even though to start is easy, to continue can be a bit of a battle against distraction, against instant gratification, I mean, I've been practicing long enough that that almost doesn't make sense to me because to me, sitting in front of my my uh, my mandala of Gohonzon and chanting or reciting Gongyo, it, it is instant gratification, <laughs> you know, but it takes a while to convert your thinking that way. So, uh, yeah, it takes effort and... Uh, that's that's what it is to be human, you know. That's the effort of being bodhisattva. Uh, just to be, to live with that example in your life is an influence to those around you. Right? Now, what's the quickest way to influence, or the quickest, the most um, widespread way to spread this teaching and to help the most people attain or work toward their enlightenment, right? Actually attain it because by chanting, they are attaining it. They just, at first, they don't even know what the heck's going on. They just know something's happening, right? Well, Nitrin, in his day, understood that because he lived in, everyone was practiced something called Buddhism, but they were practicing old teachings or, or uh, muddied teachings. Uh, uh, what's the word he uses? Erroneous teachings. Uh, so they weren't really practicing Buddhism. So he had a bigger obstacle actually, because he had to show people that what they were practicing wasn't the right way to practice. You know, people don't like to be corrected, right? But if he could convert the leaders, then the regular everyday people would, would think, well, I, I better correct what I'm doing. I must be doing something wrong. They would just, you know, I talk about authoritarianism all the time, but that's an actual component of human behavior. You know, we, if somebody will show us the way and they're in authority, we tend to accept that correction much more easily, right? So this is one of those letters. Um, you know, generally when we read something from Nitrin that is to the government, the shogunate, the leaders. It tends to be an entire treatise and it, it's, it can get really long and pedantic. And so not that it's not full of, chock full of information and, and knowledge. Um, but we don't 
get the opportunity much to read a letter to an individual who's in who's an official in the Kamakura Shogunate from Nichiren. And so, yes, it's going to be a teaching because he knows to whom he is speaking. And he knows that this person really needs to understand how Myoho Renge Kyo works in our lives. Because if this person gets it, that the influence that that person has just because of his position will be quite enormous. And so that's a key uh, person, a key bodhisattva to reach. Understand? So this letter is to Niike. Uh, he and his family became students of Nichiren's uh, doctrine of the Lotus Sutra through Niko, one of uh, Nichiren's main, main dudes, right? So, he's, uh, he's pretty well uh, sold on Lotus Sutra. Kind of amazing being as he's sitting in this Kamakura Shogunate that is so adamant against Nichiren, and yet he is a follower of Nichiren, so things are changing in the Shogunate. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's easy to practice. He can't. He probably has to be very careful what he talks about, to whom he talks about it. So this will be a letter of nurturing and caution and uh, great information on how the Lotus Sutra, the Myoho Renge Kyo law enlightenment works and what becomes uh, what one must pay attention to in one's daily life to not create one's own obstacles because they're going to arise if you've practiced any amount of time you know that one of the things about clearing your mind and attaining an, an, an Buddha-ness, right? And seeing the world that way is that the things that are in your way will oftentimes, not always, but things that are really deep down parts of your tendencies, things will manifest in your life that will almost knock you over where the hell did that come from? And, and it takes a lot of daimoku, and usually it's in hindsight that we look back and we go, now I know why that happened, what, I, what needed to change in my mind, in my behavior, that I wasn't even looking there. And you know, when that happens, you should really, really, really thank your Buddha nature for that. I mean, go in front of your mandala and chant for a while, thanking your own Gohonzon, your internal Buddha nature. Because your Buddha knows better than your samsaric you. And sometimes it puts you through things and you don't know what which way to duck and what the hell's going on. But once you're through it, you see clearly. Your Buddha mind shows you and you know Wow, I had no idea I was being such an idiot obstacle in my way. I did. I had no idea how much pain I was causing myself because I was this way or that way, or I always, whatever. This is when you have actual proof that your karma is changing, your momentum is changing. The makeup of who you are has been altered toward enlightenment toward gentleness, toward happiness, toward less attachment and desire and suffering. Again, that takes effort. And most of all, it takes determination. You have to have that kind of resolve in order to achieve that kind of liberation, that kind of enlightenment. And so Nichiren is going to talk about this.
in this letter. So here we go. What a joy it is for us to have been born in the latter day of the law and to have shared in the propagation of the Lotus Sutra. How pitiful are those who, though born in this time, cannot believe in this sutra or have confidence in this sutra. That's the beginning of the letter. So, it's a little different, right? No one can escape death once born as a human being, right? So, why do you not practice in preparation for the next life? Here's that device again, right? And I have addressed this many, many times in many videos, some videos uh, dedicated solely to this. But you must understand that we have certain... Yes, baby, yes, my puppy, yes. Sorry, my little dog is in here. <laughs> um, sorry. We humans, one of our greatest attachments, I mean, if you look at a really base level, a human being can only exist by satisfying its most craven desires, food, sex, shelter and i put shelter third because i'm telling you even if the weather's bad or it's scary outside if i'm hungry i'm gonna go i'm gonna find something to eat <laughs> you probably can tell by my jowls but <laughs> but seriously humans gotta eat and the only thing that comes uh close to that as an urge as something that must be satisfied is sex even without the idea of procreation and keeping our species going, we're biologically built to mate. That's incredibly important to us. And once you're fed and once you're mating, then shelter becomes really important. Doesn't it? So, what grows out of that the first time you have a real big fear, like that animal you tried to kill for dinner because you're so hungry and your mate is hungry. And so you go for a larger animal and it turns and threatens your life and maybe almost kills you. What I'm saying is it doesn't take long in a human being's life experience to start worrying about death. I mean, prehistoric man, today, death is always on our minds. In some abstract way, death is always on our mind. And so it's an easy attachment and desire to exploit. We even exploit it of ourselves. And it didn't take long before mankind decided, well, I can control these people by offering something they can't verify. Afterlife. What do you think is going to happen to you after you die, huh? Of course, people will remember you in a way you will still exist as a memory different memories for different people. But this enticing idea that whatever you go through in this life, you can sort of erase your balance sheet and start over somewhere else after you die. That was a weird kind of abstract security for people. And humans, see, that's the nature, that's the danger of it, of attachment right? We're so attached to this, this thing, that the idea that we can have this thing again, like a reset, <laughs> so appealing. It's so, it's, a, it's such a part of our early development as human beings. 
So it's in every culture. Some version of it. And that device, that's the manipulating device. That's the world of anger, by the way. The manipulating device that all religions use, all of them. And in a way, it makes me sorry to see this in these translations because I don't have great confidence that it was just put that plainly in Buddhism. I think Buddhism has within it so much scholarship about this life is it. Buddha is in this life. Buddha is in the now. There is no reset. There is no place you go after you die. I mean, there's so much of that. And yet, occasionally, when the lore of the, the people is referenced, as it is in so many stories, it's obviously not Buddhist to say these things, but they are grabbing certain mental ideas and using them to teach. I think it's very enticing to the student to see that as a fact of Buddhist practice. But I'm here to tell you, it is not. It is a, a tool of learning. A, a, look, look at this base attachment you have and use it to understand what's really going on, not validating it. So we're going to run into that often in different ways, not just about, if you think of it as, because um, even sometimes you'll read future lifetimes. It's future lifetimes because we're born and we die moment after moment after moment. If you remind yourself of that, you may be able to read through these things with less of attachment to these mundane ideas of going to a place, another planet, another life in the clouds. What? Come on. It's, yeah. I'm, I, I know it may be hard to hear this for some of you. I hope it isn't. Because Buddhism is, is very pragmatic, very down to earth. And it's all about the mind in this life, in this moment. So any of this rhetoric that sounds like it's, pure lands and so forth, like it's indicating some other place, really is not. It's trying to tap into that mental slippage, that, that area of enticement and attachment that we samsaric beings have, right? And what we have to work with in order to get to our enlightenment. Make sense? All right. So let's get back to this. He's talking to somebody who's in the shogunate. An official in the shogunate. So of course he's going to bring this up. Part of the Bushido code is waking up in the morning knowing that that day you will die. Not that you might die, but that you will die. Because if you enter the day with that conviction, then you can throw yourself completely into whatever you're doing, knowing that this is it. And then you go to bed at night thinking, okay, tomorrow's it, right? This is the nature of the way we brainwash ourselves. And the Bushido code for these people at the time was a very real thing. And the idea of escaping to a pure land or being reborn a shiny samurai or whatever, whatever their fantasy was, the way they absolved or washed away their pain of the day and were able to have conviction to do whatever it took was to know that they weren't going to have to suffer anymore. So the idea of an other life is just ingrained in the culture, right? So if I can tap into that idea that you're already comfortable with, and bring it back to the how you behave now, I can help you to start be, being Buddha, 
being understanding that this mo moment actually has tremendous con consequence into your future rather than coming from a place of I can just be as wild an animal as I want doesn't matter because I'm dying today in instead giving value to this moment as not one of, of uh, you know immediate honor because of dying in battle or anything like that but that it would nurture an enlightenment one an enlightenment that would influence others a bodhisattva that's that's a different idea altogether you mean that i can live in a way that makes my life more valuable tomorrow and to others to make their lives more valuable wait a minute don't know if i'm ready for all that right if you're coming from that place so that's why the references to next life there are really to us we should read that as next moments next your your uh ah come on i can't speak this morning um just simply your future in this life right birth death birth death birth death so just want to make sure you understand that because it yeah, i keep seeing this rhetoric pop up and if i come up with a better one i'll i'll replace that but just i'm relying on you to understand that buddhism is about here and now there's nothing when you when your body dies your mind dies it's over okay so let's see if maybe Nietzsche will dissect this in a in a better way than I can. No one escapes death once born as a human being. So there it is. That's your Buddhist life. So why do you not practice in preparation for the next life? When when I observe what people are doing, I realize that although they profess resolve in the Lotus Sutra and clasp its scrolls they act against the intent of the sutra and are thereby doomed to the evil lower world tendencies paths so if they work against their lotus sutra teachings and they're doomed to evil paths that's not after death that's in the future of this life evil paths are the lower worlds right the ten worlds so that's extemporaneous. To illustrate, a person has five internal organs. But when talking about heart, liver, so on. But should even one of them become diseased, it will infect all the others, and eventually the person will die. The great teacher Dengyo states that though they praise the Lotus Sutra, they destroy its heart. He means that even if people embrace, read, and praise the Lotus Sutra, if they betray its intent, they will be destroying not only Shakyamuni Buddha, but all the Buddhas in all the ten directions. Because we are all the Buddhas in all the ten directions. And so if you defile the teachings of Nyoho Renge Kyo, if you just flippantly, you know, recite the, the sutra because you know it, and aren't you, you know, a cool human because you can recite this at a moment's notice, but you have no, as I was speaking earlier in this video, no resolve, no determination to fuse with your Buddha, to enlighten, then you're not only are you not practicing with your heart with your determination to enlighten yourself but you're poisoning everybody else's study because you're saying hey i can chant faster than you i can do this you know i uh, i can chant gongo better than you yeah yeah i know how to read that stuff and you, you're cheapening it you're turning it into just a um, a game, a human entertainment. Instead of revering the depth 
of power that this practice has. We're so easily distracted, us, us humans. And so attitude and intent, attitude and intent, attitude and intent. It's everything. Our worldly misdeeds and evil tenant karma may have piled up as high as Mount Sumeru. But when we take a resolve in this sutra, they will vanish like frost or dew under the sun of the Lotus Sutra. Again, it's about the determination, the resolve, right? Attitude and intent. Nevertheless, if one commits even one or two of the 14 slanders set forth in this sutra, one's offense will be extremely difficult to expiate. Killing a single Buddha would be far greater offense than destroying all of the sentient beings in the major world system and to violate this sutra, the sutra's intent, intent would be to commit the sin of taking the lives of all the Buddhas in the Ten Directions. One who commits any of these 14 is a slanderer. Hell is a dreadful dwelling of fire, and the realm of hungry spirits is a pitiful place where, driven by starvation, they devour their own children. The realm of Ashuras consists of strife and that of animals is to kill or be killed. The hell of crimson lotus is also called, um, is so called because the intense cold of this hell makes one double over until one's back splits open and the bloody flesh emerges like a crimson lotus flower. And the hell of the great crimson lotus is even more horrible. So a lot of what he's describing here are the lower worlds, right? Hell, hunger, animality. When one falls into such an evil place, the fact that one was a ruler or a general means nothing. So it doesn't matter what your stature is in society. We all have these worlds. Tormented by the wardens of hell, one is no different than a monkey or, or a string. What use are fame and fortune then? Can one still be arrogant and persist in false beliefs? So he's really, really putting it to this, this official of the shogunate, right? This is a high-ranking samurai. Now, the guy follows Nichiren. He's already a student of Nichiren. But Nichiren's not holding back here because he knows that this man's, this human's position in government is very intoxicating. That this power that he senses will, will trump his practice of the Lotus Sutra. He's most easily deferred from it because he thinks himself so privileged. So Nitrin's knocking him down a few pegs, right? What will your position mean when you're in this hell of suffering? Because you know, it doesn't matter what your position is, how much money you have, how powerful you are. When you feel like crap, you feel like crap just like anybody else who feels like crap. You can't escape. This is samsara. Stop and ponder, he says. How rare is the resolve that moves one to give alms to the monks who knows the heart of the Lotus Sutra. One will not stray into the evil paths if one does so even once. So if you're a supporter of a monk that teaches Myoho Renge Kyo. Still greater are the benefits arising from 10 or 20 contributions or from five years, 10 years, or a lifetime of contributions. Supporting votaries of the Lotus Sutra. They are beyond even the measure of the Buddha's wisdom. 
The Buddha taught that the blessings of a single offering to the votary of this sutra are a hundred thousand, ten thousand million times greater than those of offerings of countless treasures to Shakyamuni Buddha for 80 million kalpas. Right? Making offerings to Shakyamuni Buddha for his teachings is an amazing thing. But making offerings to anyone who is a votary, a promoter, a teacher of Myoho Rengekyo, us, to one another, is much greater than even that. Because we're carrying out the mission, the vow we made in the Lotus Sutra to promulgate the Lotus Sutra. The vow we made to Shakyamuni Buddha. It's, it's the story of the Lotus Sutra, right? When one encounters this sutra, one will overflow with happiness and shed tears of joy. This is the way we need to practice. It seems impossible to repay one's debt to Shakyamuni Buddha. But by your frequent offerings to me deep in this mountain, you will repay the merciful kindness of both the Lotus Sutra and Shakyamuni Buddha. So this is a very formal way of thanking this high-ranking official for his support of Nichiren's work. And he wants at this level for this official to understand that he's not just merely some powerful guy giving baubles to Nichiren so he can survive. His offerings are for the promulgation of the Lotus Sutra, Myoho Rengekyo. It's always that way with Nichiren. He's just a vessel right strive ever harder in resolute mind and conviction and never give in to negligence never get lazy because this is your life every moment of it is your life how can you be lazy about that your life is significant if you make it so if you're focused on keeping it so resolved, if your attitude and intent is always toward your Buddha nature, how can you fail to express it? This is the lesson here. All the people appear to believe sincerely when they first embrace the Lotus Sutra, but as time passes, they tend to become less devout. Isn't this exactly what I was talking about? <laughs> this is our nature, right? We take things for granted. They no longer revere or make offerings to the monks, giving themselves up to arrogance instead and forming distorted views. Instead of reading, studying, and learning what things mean, because we get lazy, we make up stories in our own minds. Oh, yeah, that's the story about this or that. That's what they mean. Blah, blah, blah. You remember? Blah, blah. And instead of just saying, ah, let me look into that. That's interesting. I've always wondered about that. Let's study. You want to study together? Or I'll study. I'll get back to you. That's the attitude. That's the intent. Knowing the answers are already written about. Nichiren, sutras, the answers come through your Buddha nature. Chant about it, if nothing else. But we have such access to information in this world today, it's really kind of sad that we would just invent stuff on the spot for our ego to look like we're smart. And we can, it's dangerous. We can easily not only mislead the people we're talking to, but mislead ourselves. This is most frightening, Nietzsche says. Be diligent in developing your resolve until the last moment of your life. Otherwise, you will have regrets. For example, the journey from Kamakura to Kyoto takes 12 days. If you travel for 11 but stop with only one day remaining, how can you admire the moon over the capital? 
No matter what, stay close to the monk who knows the heart of the Lotus Sutra. Keep learning from him the principles of Buddhism and continue your journey of resolute mind and conviction. And I think that's an excellent point at which to stop this part one. This is a really good one. I like this one a lot. And with that, I thank you so much for participating. Please, please, please use the comments section. If you have questions, right? Share with one another your insights from this, your experience. I appreciate you guys so much your support, my patrons on Patreon, those of you who send just one-time donations whenever you're able to, really, really help support this channel. Thank you so much. Um, just couldn't do this without you. And this, this is our Sangha. You help everyone. Um, we just got to keep growing, keep this movement going of true Nichiren Buddhism without political agendas, without defilement of any sort. Namo myo renge kyo. Stay strong. Please be careful with your health. Be kind. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you for being here. Did you know there's a third way you can help support this channel? And it won't cost you a cent. Yep. If you are not able to be a patron on Patreon or use the uh, PayPal me at uh, dot com at Sifu Sylvain because uh, you don't, don't have the financial fortune to help uh, support this channel right now, you, as I say, always support this channel by watching. But you can also help us grow so that maybe one day we can get over 10,000 subscribers and YouTube will grace us with monetization. It's not a lot. But if you can make sure you're subscribed and share a video like a, a simple one, just go into the search criteria and type monk and you'll have a video that'll come up uh, that's been up for years about what is a monk. You know, it's called a monk, who, how, where, something like that. That might be a great introduction to somebody who doesn't understand what a monk is to begin with. Um, it's a tool. Use this channel as a tool to help you with your bodhisattva practice and share a video to somebody who you think, oh, I know somebody who who benefit from watching this. And in that way, you can help us grow. And that's a really good way to help your practice along as well. So just wanted to drop that in on you in case that's something that uh, you might find useful. Take care of yourself again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.